Dear comrades, I'm happy to be informed that Pakistani comrades who are inspired and guided by Marxism, Leninism, Maoism are striving to combat modern revisionism and opportunism and build a Marxist-Leninist, Maoist, Communist Party that is capable of leading the people's democratic revolution in Pakistan against imperialism, feudalism, and bureaucrat capitalism. I welcome the position and efforts of Comrade Dr. Shed Azim, former General Secretary of the Masdor Kisan, the Workers' and Peasants' Party, and present Senior Advisor to the National Students' Federation of Pakistan, as well as other comrades guided by Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, to combat the dominant reactionary and opportunistic lines plaguing the left wing of Pakistani politics, including those who seek to court the favor of imperialist China, the counter-revolutionaries who forsake the armed struggle to jockey for power in the fascist government, and so on. I also welcome the cooperation of the Maoist youth leaders and caters of the NSF who are critical of the liberal and reactionary elements in the old crop of student leaders, many of whom are diasporic and whose revival convention on March 12 promises to heighten the struggle against native uh, feudalism or Khanism, bureaucrat capitalism and imperialism about the traditional and new capitalist powers. Finally, I welcome the enthusiasm of our Maoist comrades in Pakistan to learn from the revolutionary struggles in India, Nepal, the Philippines, South and Central America, Africa, and elsewhere in the Global South in connection with the determination to hold the said revival convention on the ideological foundation of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, and in consonance with the luminous Valiant legacies left by those great revolutionaries of the past, like that of the late Dr. Rashid Hassan Khan, by way of informing you about the experience of the Communist Party of the Philippines in combating revisionism and opportunism, I propose to discuss at length the developments that followed the nominal grant of independence to the Philippines in 1946 and were pertinent to the National Liberation Movement during the reactionary puppet regimes of Rojas, Quirino, Magsaysay, Garcia, Macapagal, Marcos, Aquino, Ramos, Estrada, Arroyo, Aquino uh, the second, and uh, uh, Duterte. Then it shall be easier for me to discuss the necessity of the party as borne out by history to the present day, how the CPP arose under the guidance of uh, Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, to rectify ideological, political, and organizational errors, defeat revisionism and opportunism, and revive and advance the People's Democratic Revolution with a socialist perspective through protracted people's war and the methods employed by the revolutionary movement to combat revisionism and the fascist government seated in Manila. The Communist Party of the Philippines, New People's Army, and United Front as weapons, with armed revolution as the main form of struggle, plus the legal movement as the secondary form. In order to provide the needed context for the emergence of a revolutionary movement in the semi-feudal and semi-colonial Philippines, my comrade Pau shall also deliver a compendious outline of the general features and natural wealth of the country in which our exploited people reside, their history before and during the periods of direct colonial subjugation from the Spaniards, Americans, and Japanese, and their revolutionary tradition from the initial arrival of the conquistadores to the rising of 1896 held by the Katipunan. This section is the to come before mine. I hope that our presentation can aid you in learning, at least in general terms, how to identify the errors of revisionism and opportunism, criticize, repudiate, and rectify them in a wholesome rectification movement that has an essentially educational character.
Only you, the Pakistani proletarian revolutionaries, can do the best possible concrete analysis of your history, concrete conditions, and concrete revolutionary practice. After merging with the rural-based Socialist Party in 1938 under the auspices of the Comintern and the Communist Party of the USA and in accordance with the anti-fascist Popular Front, the old Communist Party of the Philippines laid a sound basis for forming the People's Army against Japan, or the Hukbalahap. On March 29, 1942, after the Japanese invasion of the Philippines in December 1941. But soon after the founding and spectacular guerrilla offensives of the Hukbalahap in central Luzon, the Japanese invaders launched a counteroffensive which demoralized the Vicente Lava leadership and made it adopt a right opportunist line of retreat for defense by dividing the Hukbalahab squadrons or companies into small ineffective teams of three to five combatants and adhering to the U.S. line of making Filipino guerrilla male spies to prepare for the U.S. reconquest of the Philippines. In September 1943, the old CPP held the Bagumbali Conference to correct the right opportunist error of retreat for defense and rebuild the guerrilla companies for offensives against the Japanese occupation forces. These offensives would make the People's Army strong in the entire region of central Luzon, outskirts of Manila, and parts of southern Luzon up to the total defeat of Japan in 1945. But the Aforsen Conference also made a new right opportunist or reformist decision to welcome the return of U.S. imperialism and allow it to establish a semi-colonial Philippine state in 1946. This fell into line with the peace and democracy call of the revisionist Earl Browder, who wanted to convert the CPUSA to a mere political association within the bourgeois state. The old CPP conformed to the nominal grant of independence by U.S. imperialism to the Philippines and let the U.S. retain its military basis and the property rights of U.S. corporations and citizens under the U.S.-Philippine Treaty of General Relations in 1946. It formed the Democratic Alliance to combine with the Nacionalista Party of the outgoing Osmeño government and engage in electoral struggle against the U.S.-supported Liberal Party whose presidential candidate was the former pro-Japanese collaborator Manuel Rojas. The Democratic Alliance succeeded in electing six congressional candidates whose number was enough to block the Parrot Amendment. This constitutional amendment allowed U.S. corporations and citizens rights equal to those of Filipinos in exploiting natural resources and operating public utilities. Based on Trump up charges of electoral fraud and terrorism, the Democratic Alliance members of Congress were kicked out by the Liberal Party majority. Such an anti-democratic act by the Liberal Party against the Democratic Alliance added fuel to the continuing outrage of the people over the arrest of uh, labor and peasant leaders and massacres in the countryside by the Philippine Constabulary and paramilitary forces, so-called civilian guards. These despicable acts were calculated to allow the landlords to recover the land from the peasants in central Luzon and destroy the People's Army. They were carried out under the direction of the U.S. by the regime of Manuel Rojas from 1946 to 1948 and that of Elbido Quirino from 1948 to 1953. They pushed the people and the revolutionary forces to resume the armed struggle against the U.S. and its puppet government. Thus, the old CPP, under the leadership of Jose Lava, decided to resume the armed struggle, but it took the erroneous left opportunist line of uh, winning the revolution in only two years by relying on the spontaneous uprising of the people against the Quirino regime without painstaking mass work, agrarian revolution, and mass-based building beyond the regions of central Luzon, 
Manila Rizal, and the Southern Tagalog regions. The old CPP was able to launch spectacular and successful offensives against major enemy military camps in central Luzon in 1949, but later, within the same year, the enemy was able to launch bigger offensives by some 30 battalions against the 2,500 fighters of the People's Liberation Army, or the Hukbong Mapagpalaya ng Bayan, HMB, based mainly in the Sierra Madre and to round up and arrest the entire Politburo uh, leadership of uh, the old CPP based in Manila. Jesus Lava assumed leadership as General Secretary of the old CPP in 1951 and increasingly failed to counter effectively the enemy campaign of military suppression. In 1955, he put forward the right opportunist line of converting the People's Army to an organizational brigade for legal struggle and in 1957 issued the so-called single file policy which liquidated the collective life of CPP leading organs and branches by requiring all CPP members to join a queue merely for receiving political transmissions written solely by the General Secretary who was detached from the masses and concentrated on hiding himself in Manila. Since their conquest of the Philippines, the U.S. had directed, trained, and equipped the Filipino puppet troops to carry out the armed counter-revolution. The Central Intelligence Agency groomed the Defense Secretary Ramon Magsaysay to replace the discredited corrupt President Elpidio Quirino in the elections of 1953. After running an extremely pro-U.S. and anti-communist regime, Magsaysay died from a plane crash and was replaced by his Vice President Carlos P. Rong Garcia. The Garcia regime pursued a pro-U.S. and anti-communist policy. It was during his term that the anti-subversion law of 1957 was originally drafted by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency and was enacted by the Puppet Congress, despite the defeat and disintegration of the old CPP and uh, uh, old Civil uh, People's Army, the HMB. The law provided for the death penalty to officers of the CPP and life sentence to CPP members upon the presentation of two prosecution witnesses. But President Garcia pretended to be an economic nationalist by Filipinizing the Chinese-owned retail trade enterprises and by maintaining foreign exchange controls until the end of his term in 1961. Thus was maintained the long tradition of the ruling classes to use the local Hokkien Chinese minority as an alien scapegoat to obscure their puppetry, the foreign despots, and their own exploitation of the masses. It was during the Garcia regime that a new crop of proletarian revolutionaries would arise from 1959 to 1961 through study groups in the University of the Philippines to learn the fundamental principles of Marxism-Leninism and the new democratic revolution, to continue the unfinished Philippine Revolution, and to fight immediately the witch hunt being carried out by the Reactionary Congress in accordance with the anti-subversion law. To avoid being charged as communist subversives, the young proletarian revolutionaries let themselves be called widely as nationalists in the anti-imperialist sense. They succeeded in gaining mass support and stopping the witch hunt by organizing a demonstration of 5,000 students that scuttled the anti-communist congressional hearings on March 15, 1961. They began to link up with labor and peasant organizations. Jesus Lava noticed my anti-imperialist writings and the student mass actions and tried to contact me in 1961, but it was only in December of 1962 that his intermediary could link up with me. I agreed to the proposal for reviving the old CPP, and in early 1963 I became a member of the five-member executive committee, which was created for that s s same purpose. Jasdando Magapagal became president in 1961 with a program of so-called free enterprise, 
decontrol of foreign exchange, open door to foreign investments and bourgeois land reform. Due to the intensity of the Cold War, the anti-communist crackdown and the disintegration of the old CPP and Old People's Army. The trade union and peasant movement were in the main openly led by reformists who were associated with the reactionary regime. The U.S. Embassy, the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, the AFL-CIO, and the Jesuit-run Institute of Social Order. But there were the anti-imperialist and progressive labor leaders who formed the Lapiang Mangagawa or Workers' Party in 1962. The young proletarian revolutionaries started in June 1962 to be active and holding seminars for trade unions under the auspices of the Lapiang Mangagawa in holding protest mass actions against the unequal treaties, agreements, and arrangements with the U.S. and against the puppetry of the Magapagal regime. They also sent youth teams to the factories and the urban and rural poor communities to do social investigation and mass work in preparation for the organization of Kabataang Makabayan, the KM, or Patriotic Youth, as a comprehensive youth organization of young workers and peasants, students, and young professionals. The Kabataang Makabayan was formed on November 30, 1964, and became the spearhead of protest mass actions of youth workers and peasants against U.S. imperialism and the reactionary regime. In 1965, the young proletarian revolutionaries, together with veteran worker and peasant cadres, were already demanding that the Congress of the old CPP be held and that a provisional central committee be created for the purpose. I was assigned by the executive committee to draft a political report in preparation of the Congress. I drafted a report which identified, criticized, and repudiated the major errors that had afflicted the old CPP since 1942. The Lava revisionist renegades were offended by the report and tried to trash it. They refused to criticize the subjectivist and opportunist errors of the brothers Vicente, Jose, and Jesus Lava, who had succeeded each other as CPP general secretary. They blocked the implementation of the plan to hold a congress of the old CPP and to plan the resumption of revolutionary armed struggle on the basis of the progress of the mass movement. They wanted to prolong the thoroughly stagnant condition of the old CPP. Worst of all, they were already in contact with and under the influence of the revisionist CP of the Soviet Union through William Pomeroy, who was positioned in the United Kingdom. And they began to echo both the Khrushchev slogans of the party of the whole people and state of the whole people amounting to bourgeois populism and peaceful transition to socialism, peaceful economic competition and peaceful coexistence amounting to bourgeois pacifism. And the Khrushchev slogans of social fascism, social imperialism, and the so-called international dictatorship of the proletariat. Thus, the proletarian revolutionaries and the veteran worker and peasant cadres decided to break away from the old CPP in April 1966, launch a rectification movement, and prepare for the re-establishment of the CPP under the guidance of Marxism, Leninism, and Mao Zedong thought, today called Maoism. The conditions were ready for the establishment of the CPP on December 26, 1968, and the founding of the New People's Army on March 29, 1969. The Magapagat regime became discredited enough by its unfulfilled promises of economic development and prosperity and was replaced by the Marcos regime in 1965 on the vague bombast of making the Filipino nation great again. Marcos had no better idea than to use foreign loans to improve the infrastructure for the continued colonial exchange of Philippine raw materials and foreign manufacturers. At the same time, he overpriced the infrastructure projects in order to cut into contracts and accumulate bureaucratic loot. 
From the start of this rule, Marcos focused on having a personal grip on the reactionary armed forces, promised to increase their funding, troop strength, and equipment with U.S. support in exchange for the use of the U.S. military bases. He was obsessed with staying in power beyond the constitutional limits and plundering the economy through graft-laden infrastructure projects, tourist facilities, and related contracts financed by foreign direct investments and loans. After his term of, uh, in office from 1965 to 1969, Marcos increasingly prayed about the social volcano about to explode in the Philippines and ultimately he took advantage of the clerical fascist demand for amendments to the Philippine Constitution and control the Constitutional Convention in order to insert provisions in the Constitution that would enable him to become a fascist dictator. He engaged in forced flag operations like the Plaza Miranda grenade attack on the opposition party in 1971 and other bombing incidents in 1971 and 1972. He ascribed this to the CPP and the NPA in order to slander them and set the stage for the 1971 suspension of the writ of habeas corpus and the 1972 declaration of martial law and imposition of fascist dictatorship on the people. He undertook a campaign of anti-communist hysteria claiming that the CPP and NPA were already about to seize state power. But the CPP had only 1,000 members, some 300 red fighters in a few guerrilla zones, and mass base of at least 200,000 in urban and rural areas. The organized strength of the revolutionary movement was still small and weak. Marcos exaggerated in his 1972 martial law proclamation that the NPA had 10,000 red fighters and he was about to save the republic and build a new society. He succeeded in imposing a fascist dictatorship on the people for 14 years from 1972 to 1986. But this U.S. supported fascist dictatorship drove the broad masses of the people to join and support the new democratic revolution through protracted people's war. By 1986, the CPP membership had more than 10,000 members and the NPA had more than 6,100 red fighters, aside from the far greater number of personnel of the People's Militia and self-defense units. The revolutionary mass organizations of workers, peasants, women, youth, and others had millions of members, and the National Democratic Front and the local organs of political power of the People's Democratic Government had many more millions under governance and influence. All these revolutionary forces were nationwide and deeply rooted among the toiling masses in more than 90% of the Philippine provinces. All the post Marcos pseudo democratic regimes, from that of Corazon Aquino to that of uh, the Rodrigo Duterte, uh, have engaged in US supported campaigns of military suppression against the armed revolution. Despite the short period, every regime has devoted to using peace negotiations to try to hoodwink the revolutionary movement and to win across the table what it cannot win in the battlefield. The U.S. directed reactionary armed forces have always fouled up the peace negotiations. The incumbent Duterte regime has turned out to be the worst of the pseudo-democratic regimes as it tried to copy and surpass the brutality of the Marcos fascist regime in trying to wage an all-out war policy and, and destroy the revolutionary movement. But it has failed to destroy the revolutionary movement and has generated far worse conditions of oppression and exploitation that are more favorable than ever before for waging revolution. The CPP membership has grown from about only 100 in 1968 to 150,000 now, the ranks of whom are now organized across the entire country and rooted deeply 
amongst the toiling masses. True to the leadership of the CPP, under the guidance of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, the NPA has grown from only nine automatic rifles to thousands of such rifles, with auxiliary reserves of tens of thousands in the People's Militia and Self-Defense Corps of the Revolutionary Mass Organizations. The enemy has admitted recently that the NPA has wiped out 15,000 troops in battles. In contrast, the enemy has killed more than 50,000 non-combatants in malevolent attacks on the civilian population. The mass base of the revolutionary movement has grown from around 50,000 in 1968 to millions in revolutionary mass organizations under alliances mainly within the National Democratic Front of the Philippines and under the organs of political power which constitute the People's Democratic Government. There are now two governments in the Philippines. One is the revolutionary government of workers and peasants under the leadership of the CPP in the countryside, and the other is the reactionary government of big compradors, landlords, and bureaucrat capitalists directed by U.S. imperialism in the cities. Based on the short historical narrative that I have just given to you, you can see the necessity of having the Communist Party as the advanced detachment of the proletariat and as the leading force in the revolution. While the old CPV was afflicted by subjectivism and opportunism, it could not lead effectively the National Liberation Movement against the Japanese occupation during World War II. The right opportunist Vicente Lava leadership of the old CPP welcomed the return of U.S. imperialism and failed to carry forward the revolutionary struggle of the people for national and social liberation. The Jose Lava leadership adopted a left opportunist line of striving to win the revolution in two years' time, but this line was definitely defeated by U.S. imperialism and Filipino puppets as early as 1951, and the Jesus-Lava leadership did not want to rectify the previous errors and proceeded to take the right opportunist line of liquidating the People's Army in 1955 and the old CPP in 1957, and to echo the Krosevite line of bourgeois populism and pacifism, an indefinite legal struggle without any definite plan to resume the People's Democratic Revolution. The CPP became an effective uh, uh, advanced detachment and leading force of the proletariat and the entire people when it was re-established on December 26, 1968, adopted the guidance of Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, or Maoism. The general line and program of People's Democratic Revolution through protracted People's War and the organizational principle of democratic centralism and carried out the rectification movement to criticize and repudiate the grave ideological, political, and organizational errors of the series of Lava General Secretaries in the old CPP. The first great rectification movement against the subjectivist, opportunist, and revisionist errors of the Lavas contributed greatly to laying a strong Marxist-Leninist Maoist foundation of the re-established CPP. The CPP has grown in strength and advanced as the leading force of the Philippine Revolution, has overcome tremendous odds and major errors confronted by the second great rectification movement and has won brilliant victories against every major campaign of military suppression unleashed by the U.S. imperialism and its Filipino puppets. In carrying out the rectification movement against the Lavaite errors of revisionism and opportunism from 1942 to 1966, we had to read the available documents of the old CPP and in the main interviewed many veteran cadres, including the Lavaites and those critical of them who were directly and personally knowledgeable about the policies and actions of the central leadership of the old CPP from 1942 onwards. Then we analyzed and drew conclusions 
from the fax in order to draft the rectification document, rectify errors, and rebuild the party. We have carried out a comprehensive and thoroughgoing campaign of education among the party cadres and members and the revolutionary mass activists on the threshold of joining the CPP. We have undertaken study meetings of various sizes at different levels on the ideological line of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism against imperialism, revisionism, and all reaction. On the political program of People's Democratic Revolution through protracted people's war in a semi-colonial and semi-feudal country and on the principle of democratic centralism. We have prepared and used text and study courses at the basic, intermediate and advanced levels for the training and development of CPP cadres and members as well as revolutionary mass activists. We have learned in theory and in practice how to build the CPP, the New People's Army and the United Front as the three magic weapons of the Philippine Revolution. We have learned how to build revolutionary forces by building them, and we have learned how to fight by fighting the enemy, seizing arms, and accumulating armed and political strength self-reliantly. To enhance our strength, to correct errors and shortcomings, and to improve our work, fighting skills, and manner of work, we have engaged in timely and periodic meetings to assess and evaluate our work and engage in criticism and self-criticism. To confront and deal with major errors and shortcomings such as the, the subject, subjectivist and opportunist errors, from 1980 to 1991, we have carried out the Second Great Rectification Movement as an educational movement from 1991 to 1998, with reaffirm our basic principles and rectify errors as the main document. As the most progressive political and productive force, a CPP is needed to lead the new democratic and socialist stages of the Philippine Revolution. The NPA is needed to seize political power from the exploiting classes through protracted people's war in order to complete the new democratic revolution and consequently to be able to carry out the socialist revolution. The United Front is needed to reach the broad masses of the people and their millions and facilitate the formation of local organs of political power of the People's Democratic Government. It has always been made absolutely clear to the CPP rank and file and to the revolutionary masses that armed struggle is the main form of revolutionary struggle even while legal forms of struggle are also undertaken. Without the People's Army, the people have nothing. The People's Army is needed for winning victories in the armed struggle, for carrying out the agrarian revolution as the main content of the democratic revolution, and for guaranteeing the basic worker-peasant alliance as the foundation for building the people's democratic government in the countryside before the seizure of cities. I hope that I have said enough to help you understand the re-establishment of the CPP under the guidance of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism against imperialism, revisionism, and all reaction. The program of People's Democratic Revolution through protracted people's war and the principle of democratic centralism. I hope too that my presentation helps shed light on the problems that you must solve and the tasks that you must carry out to build your own party ideologically, politically, and organizationally. Moreover, I wish you the utmost success in building the Marxist-Leninist Maoist Party of the proletariat, the People's Army, for waging the armed revolution and seizing political power, and finally, the United Front for gaining the active support of the people in their hundreds of millions. For further reading, I recommend the books number five and six of the season reader series on the Communist Party from its uh, reconstitution in 1968 to the present day, as well as other books in the aforesaid compendium. Both digital and physical copies of these are available for procurement 
from major electronic publishing outlets, including Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo Rakuten, and many others. Thank you.